The views, information, and opinions expressed during the following program are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent the views of Access Communications, its representatives, or its employees. has been an important center for the Roman Catholic Church and for French Canadian culture since it was founded in 1907 by Father Louis Pierre Gravel. One of the most popular attractions and central focal point is the cathedral located at the head of Main Street. We're going to go meet with local expert Louis Stanger to find out more about the Our Lady of Assumption Co-Cathedral. It's beautiful. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, yeah, I, uh, I'm not from Gravelbeau. I'm from Pontex. But uh, I went to the college here. And so that was back in the, towards the end of the 50s to the 60s. I graduated with a BA from the college in 66. And then I went to law school in Saskatoon and uh, so when I got through law school, I articled with a firm in Swift Current. And from there, they sent me here because I could speak French. And uh, from then on, well, I met my wife in 70, uh, 72. We got married in 74. And I raised uh, my wife and I, four kids in town here. And even while I was practicing law, I took an interest in uh, the history of the community because as you can see, it's uh, got the beautiful buildings and uh, it's got a reputation that's larger than life, really. Mm -hmm. So how long have you been doing these tours for? Oh, I can't remember how far back. I, I did them when I was practicing law. Uh, if somebody phoned, I always managed to get a little bit of time to come and do a tour because, I mean, a tour takes about a half an hour to three quarters of an hour to do the cathedral justice. And uh, so that's when it started, like in the 60s. And, of course, uh, when the museum moved to Main Street in 2001, I was involved and I, I uh, retired in 2008 as a lawyer mm -hmm. and from then on well I was the curator of the museum and, and so on so I, I've given tours here for I don't know I can't remember how far back. <laughs> <laughs> do you get quite a few visitors that come through? Uh, we used to do about 1500 people before the mm -hmm. pandemic hit. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's been a painful exercise, but I think things are going, getting back on a roll here because last year I noticed that uh, numbers of visitors started to increase again. Good, what do you love most about living in this town? Well, I think you know, you're blown away by the beauty of the community, like it's, it's got all these, uh, and I've noticed that Gravelberg is known all over Canada. It uh, has a reputation of its own. One uh, visitor uh, said, uh, he put a comment on, in the register and he said, it's the most historical prairie town. So that's how people react. When they come here, they're just floored by what they see. Mm -hmm. They can't believe that this is here on the open prairie. What do you think your town is most well known for? Tourism, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
the fact that we uh, have always had uh, French schools here. So if you want to get a, an education in French, it's ideal. Mm -hmm. Like both schools in Revelberg here teach French. And now the college is involved in distance education as well. Mm -hmm. And they teach trades in French. So yeah. And with tourism, do you ever play tourist? Do you, do you have a favorite place that you like to travel in Saskatchewan? Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to think there. I, it's probably the Cypress Hills. Yeah. Uh, that whole area is rather fascinating. Mm -hmm. And it's more connected to this part of the country than we think. Like, you know, the Métis in Maple Creek? They... Well, you might as well say they were the French Canadians' cousins or vice versa. They were here before us, a long before. And uh, just recently, I took part in a uh, session that uh, talked about Métis storytelling. And that was just fascinating. So talk about this church. It's full of history. Where do we start? <laughs> well, we can start from the back here. And we've got a photo of Father Mayan, okay. who was the second parish priest. And he was the painter that, and there he is right here. He was the painter that painted the entire cathedral. And what was his full name? Shal, C-H-A-R-L-E-S, Maya, M-A-I-L-L-A-R-D. He came from France. He studied art at the University of Lille. He always wanted to be a priest, so when he immigrated, he finished his seminary at St. Boniface. And from St. Boniface, they stationed him in St. Lazar in Manitoba. He spent a few years there and eventually became the parish priest in Wolseley, Saskatchewan, which is just east of Regina. And from there, well, I think he spent six or seven years there. And by 1917, while they were about to start building the church, he was posted here. So everything just, you know, it's like Providence. Everything fit. And so by 1921, he started to decorate the church, all these paintings. And it took him 10 years to do absolutely everything, which includes the, the windows. Originally, he hand-painted the windows. And, but by the end of the 70s, Bishop Dillacky here could see that the windows were showing a lot of wear and tear. So, uh, what he did is he had all the windows uh, replaced with stained glass windows that come from Brittany in France. And uh, it took six years to replace all the windows. It's a fella from Burns and Hanley in Regina that did it all, a Burns. And uh, as you can see, the stained glass certainly enhances the cathedral. Uh, in the summertime, uh, it's very uh, interesting to see the play of lights that, uh, from the sun that goes through the windows and bounces off the pillars. and So it makes the cathedral even more scenic. Mm -hmm. Louis, can you tell me about the words that are on the walls there? Yeah, like you can see the tall lettering, it's in French. It uh, represents the seven deadly sins. La gourmandise means uh, overeating, mm. uh, gluttony. And so you've got all the, the seven deadly saints that he painted on, and the, the drapery as such, the brownish color, represents the sinful condition of man. The reddish color represents the blood of Christ. So the theme, the main theme in the cathedral is the redemption of man's sin through the blood of Christ. You're going to see that come up time and time again. Oh, so there's a common theme with that. Right. Okay. And can you tell us about the second level? Yes. Well, uh, the second level is the way of the cross. And it all, it's all starts from there where you see uh, 
Pontius Pilate washing his hands of Jesus. And it uh, travels around the cathedral counterclockwise. Why counterclockwise? I can't explain that. Uh, what's unusual is he used people from the town as models. So we know who the people were that were painted in. Uh, most of those people. And the second thing that's rather remarkable is he painted this on the backside of linoleum as opposed to canvas. Now, either canvas wasn't available. He obviously knew what he was doing because the paintings have stood up very well. There's no breakage. Uh, they're what they were when he painted them. So I was thinking of the upkeep, like, does it have to be glossed over? Or, well, you know? it was uh, professionally cleaned only once. When Princess Anne came from Britain, she came to Regina, they brought her here. Um, yeah, it was professionally cleaned only once that time. Mm -hmm. But other than that, it's never been touched up. Really? It's what it was. And I noticed that there's a third band of paintings. Can you tell yeah. us about those? Well, that's the story of St. Philomena. She was the original patroness saint of the cathedral. Uh, she was a young girl in Rome at the time when the Romans were still persecuting the Christians. And uh, she had been promised in marriage by her family to a Roman general, which she refused because she considered herself a bride of Christ. Uh, so the Romans, you can see, well, you have to duck in and out of the pillars here. Um, you can see that the soldiers are attempting to do her in. They're shooting their arrows, but miraculously, the arrows are coming back on the soldiers. And then you can see in the next part here where they took her out to sea in a boat and they wanted to drown her by wrapping an anchor around her neck. Oh and goodness. you can see the tip of the anchor there. Mm -hmm. It looks like a key. But there's an angel that comes down to save her from that. And then they put her in jail. And so that takes you right to the end of uh, this part here. Mm -hmm. And then you have to jump across. Over here, you've got the rest of the story. Uh, so you can see the angel telling St. Philomena in the corner there that she must die for her faith as a Christian. And then she's brought up in front of the Roman soldier and he has his sword drawn and he executes her. And then this whole part here is to do with the catacombs in Rome, which is where they buried the early saints. Because she was an early saint in the 60s, while Bishop de Cus was here, the Catholic Church decided that they were going to have an investigation to, de to determine whether or not she had gone through all the stages that you need to go through to be a saint. Right. Uh, unfortunately, while they were doing this, they dropped her name from the Catholic liturgical calendar. And that didn't sit well because she was a very popular saint. She was the patron of saint of many parishes down east. Mm -hmm. And so the bishops here could see that there was a lot of controversy. It's at that point that he chose to rededicate the cathedral to Our Lady of the Assumption, which is what we know the church by now. Mm -hmm. So they did eventually confirm that she was a saint, but the bishop chose to leave things the way they were. And now onto the ceiling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the glorious ceiling. What can you tell me about it? Well, uh, the way he did it, like you don't see a middle aisle in this church, which is unusual. Um, but it's because he set up his scaffolding so that it would come down the side aisles. And when his parishioners would come in for Sunday mass, he would get them to move his scaffolding according to what he wanted. And then he could climb and paint another stretch on the ceiling. He'd go right to the top, lay flat on his back. Very often he would use a mirror like Michelangelo used in the Sistine Chapel. 
because he was trained as a Renaissance painter when he studied art at the University of Lille. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's over 300 angels in the ceiling. And Father Maillard went back to Rome. He looked at, uh, obviously influenced by the Sistine Chapel. Uh, and he came back and he made some changes. Like he was the type of a guy, very humble guy and very conscious of his parishioners. And uh, there's a, a bit of a, an anecdote that comes through that he originally had painted all the saints or the, the angels naked because that's what they did in Europe. Uh, but when he come back, he realized that uh, some of his parishioners were not happy with that. So what he did is he painted uh, ribbons in front of their privates. Now, whether that's true or not, but it makes for an interesting story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> what end do you think he started at that one or this one? I think he probably started uh, yeah. over there. And then worked his way up. Yeah, and you can see that tall window at the back. Mm -hmm. Well, by the time they changed over the windows, uh, Our Lady of the Assumption had been the patroness saint for many years. So they chose to put her in there. And uh, of course, you can see the, the Virgin being led up into heaven with all her angels, with their musical instruments and so on. About how long do you think it took them oh, to Oh, I that? would, I'm sure that it took uh, over a year to put that together. It's, mm -hmm. yeah. And then you can see some of the windows that are at the top here. And those represent the uh, glorious, the joyous, and the sorrowful mysteries of the Catholic Church. And down here, all these windows here that you see with the apostles at the top and the symbols in the bottom, those are the sacraments of the Catholic Church. Now, each stained glass window obviously tells us a story. Can you talk about this one? Well, this one here is Moses and the Ten Commandments. And you can see the burning bush at the bottom here. But, uh, you know, when the kids come, I often quiz them. And I ask them, what do you see that's not consistent time-wise in that circle window where Moses is with the Ten Commandments. And uh, you know, it's surprising how many kids will get it. They'll say, well, what are Roman numerals belonging on the, ten, on the tablets? Because Moses would have been a Hebrew and the Hebrews would write from the other side and they would put their numbers on the right-hand side. Uh, so it just goes to show that, uh, you know, the church was Romanized. And uh, it's an in interesting feature that uh, I like to quiz the kids because it gets them thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, you're looking at a wheat sheaves here in uh, stained glass. And uh, that's basically the Saskatchewan connection. And you see a lot of wheat cheese. Like uh, you can see some on both sides. And uh, they're stained glass pretty well in every nook and cranny. So when we come up to the alcove here, which has an altar on this side, um, we can see that there's a special stained glass window here which is uh, the old style of how they used to make stained glass. You can see where it's blown glass because you can see the air bubbles in the, in the pieces. There's about 250 pieces of glass there. Unfortunately, the priest that had this done was killed in a car accident in 1966, and that was the end of that project. But uh, the stained glass itself is opaque. It doesn't let the light through. Um, and, uh, well, obviously he was of French ancestry because you've got La Fleur de Lis and, uh, of course, the cross. But it's very beautiful. And uh, 
they're all kinds of sizes, these pieces, eh? And you can see that they're very thick and they're jagged on the edges. So they were busted out and probably chiseled back in. And that window would be very heavy. If you look at it closely, it sort of has a very slow curve. So what happens here is that the parishioners will come and they will kneel and say a prayer on Sundays. And very often they will light a candle to the bereaved. And this is where the communion comes from. It's the tabernacle. These are huge. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's what I call the front of the cathedral. It's the nave or the sanctuary. And there's seven paintings here, and they're huge. The first one here is the, uh, the Garden of Eden scene. And it's painted on the backside of Lionel. There's a lady that's, well, well, I think she's 100 years old now, and she remembers uh, Father uh, Maillard painting these at the parish hall. Mm -hmm. And they were brought over and then they were stretched out and put in the church here. And she can remember Father Maillard as a young girl mixing his paints because he took that with him when he died. I mean, like most artists, they mm -hmm. don't give up their trade secrets. And so that's the first painting. The second one is uh, St. John the Bas Baptist announcing that Jesus is the real Messiah. And these paintings are loaded with symbol. The old tree is the Old Testament. The young tree is the New Testament. The stones on the way are the trials of a lifetime in getting to salvation. So you can see that theme comes back. And then of course the lamb, the lamb of God, which is the Christian. And then the next painting we can see there is the transfiguration of Christ. And we can see Moses on one side, Elijah on the other, and three of the Christ's disciples at the foot. And the middle painting, which is the first that he did, it represents the crucifixion, the redemption, and the Holy Trinity all in one. And when you look at the top there, you can see in Latin, it's written. written sanguis Christi, which in Latin means the blood of Christ. Redemptio Vestra, which means your redemption. So he affirms the main theme right there. And then the one that's to the right here is the resurrection scene. And you can see that the artist uses light a lot. Uh, that painting is showing a lot of depth. And then the next painting to it is Jesus handing over the scepter of the church to St. Peter, who, who's on his knees. And by then, there's only 11 of Christ's disciples because Judas is gone. And of course, the sheep again are the Christians. Now, this one looks a little different than the other ones. Yeah, well, it is. It's, uh, it really has nothing to do with the Bible. It's the painter's idea of what he thought his corner of heaven would look like. And of course, you've got his favorite saint, Saint Philomena on the left-hand side. And then you've got Saint, uh, uh, oh, I know the term in French, uh, but anyhow, he was a priest that had a special devotion to Saint Philomena. He came from Northern France. He was very popular. And so some of his popula popularity went to St. Philomena. That mm -hmm. accounts for the fact that she was popular as well. And then you've got the Holy Virgin, the three persons in God. Uh, you've got the heavenly scene with the angels. And down here, you've got the man, the woman, and the child. And what I like to point out is the fact that when you look at between God the Father and God the Son there, you can see the Holy Spirit. And if you look at the middle painting here, just below God the Father, you've got the Holy Spirit, the dove. And when you look up at the pillars, if you look above the cross here, on the pillar, at the top of the pillar, you can see the dove. 
So the dove, he wanted to be omnipresent in the cathedral. So between the whiteness of the cathedral and the dove, his message of peace certainly comes across. And you can feel it in here. It's a very peaceful place. Mm -hmm. This tour is so great, I'm getting tired. I think I'll have a seat in this lovely chair. No, 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 you can't oh, sit in there. Is it special? We call this the bishop's chair. <laughs> It was a gift from the sisters of the convent, the Jesus Mary sisters. They've got a mother house in France, in Lyon, in France, which is the second biggest city in France. And it goes back to share to 17th uh, century Italian royalty. Mm -hmm. And so it was a gift to the bishop at the time. We don't allow people to sit in the chair. Um, Mind you, you can take a photo, no problem. Uh, but that, to, to me, is quite precious because uh, it's only used when the bishop comes. Okay. And the bishop is from? Uh, bishop Bolin actually is from here. Wow. He's the Archbishop of Regina, Donald Bolin. I bet he And he comes coming. from west of town. Okay. Uh, or he was on a farm west of town oh, here. Neat. Yeah. So he gets to come home and sit in a special chair. Exactly. Awesome. Well, this woodwork is actually splendid. Can you talk about it? Well, this here is a confessional. And, uh, you know, uh, to uh, do con confessions back in the good old days, they would use the confessional. Now it's done more, the person just sits beside the priest and talks to him. But when you look at the confessional, this is where the priest would sit in the confessional. Mm -hmm. And then over here, you've got the area where the penitent would kneel. Louis, thank you so much for showing us this beautiful cathedral. Now, if someone was interested in getting a tour, who do they contact? Well, in the off season, it's myself. Okay. It's uh, uh, 650-8228. Okay. But uh, in the summertime, July and August, there are students at the museum, and they will give a tour of the cathedral as well. We, uh, we share the hours there. But for basically, if you're beyond the hours or in the off-season, get a hold of me. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. And thank you for doing this. The Our Lady of Assumption Cathedral is the jewel of Gravelberg. I love how Louis and other members of the community preserve their heritage and proudly share the knowledge and its history. Can you believe we have a cathedral like that in our province? Well, we're off to the next community. I'm going to let you lead the way. Thank you.